Good morning, one of the Community Christian Church. Another time for us to come together to come together and worship and praise and hear God's word. Uh, I don't know about you, but I've had one of those weeks where the Lord is, I keep talking about how he's working with me. I, I, I had somebody talk last week about asking God for, for wisdom. I don't know about you, but that was Jonathan. And so I started this week having a special time that I asked God for wisdom. And man, has he really, really shown me some stuff where I think that I need to work. And so with that being said, I don't come here happy and jolly as I usually am because I think I'm under just a little bit of thought on, on everything. And so this morning going to open up. It says every move I make, I make in you. I wanted to give you some scripture so that you can uh, understand that by this life, there's nothing that you and I do to make it through. There's nothing we do. We, we are as helpless as helpless can be. So I want to remind you of this, and it comes from Job. And it is Job 34, down in verse 14. And it says, and this is talking of the Creator, If it were his intention, and he withdrew his spirit and breath, all humanity would perish. And mankind would return to dust. So I don't know about you. The very first thing I start my prayer is, is, Dear Lord, thank you for the breath of life that you give me. Because there is nothing in me that could sustain. And so today I invite you to come. And we're going to praise and worship. And we're going to sing. We're going to hear scripture. And we're going to hear Jonathan deliver from his heart a message that God has laid on there. And I don't know about you. I'm excited about that. So let's stand, let's sing, and let's get busy in praise and worship in our Lord. Every move I make, I make in you. Sing it out. Every move I make. Father, we come before you to open this service, to praise you, to worship you. Lord, you deserve everything that we can give to you in praise. Lord, you are glorious. You are magnificent. You are wonderful. And God, everything about us is filthy rags. If you do not come along and pick us up. And you did that through your son, Jesus. You picked us up. 
And Lord, you allowed us the opportunity to spend eternity with you. Lord, may we spread that word. May we go from this place and do more outside these walls and let it not just be here. Lord God, lead this time of praise and worship. Be with Jonathan. Lay upon his heart everything we need to hear, God. And I pray that we listen and I pray that we act. As you say, we say here, we're going to so grow and go. And we thank you for that mission with inside this church and everyone who works, everyone who hears, and everyone who goes out. We love you and praise you, God, and thank you. Bless this time now. It's all about you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. We talk about walking with the Lord, and now just come and rain on me. God's people said, amen. 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 Invite the Lord in. Invite him to come. We love it. Here I am to worship, Lord. Here I am to worship. i 
down into darkness Open my eyes, let me see Beauty that made this heart adore you Hope of a life spent with you So here I am to worship Here I am come to you today and I just pray that we all are here to worship uh, with open hearts and minds and we just we lay it all out for you because you are the creator of everything there's nothing that we can hide from you there's nothing we should hide from you and I pray that each and every one of us here is prepared to receive your message in whatever way he or she needs it and I hope that with your guidance and just with your perfect knowledge that we can all go where we need to go and do as we need to do and I pray that you will watch over us for the rest of this service and into the rest of our lives in Christ's name amen Amen. Redemption is the action of regaining or gaining possession of something in exchange for payment. The action of saving or being saved from sin, error, 
or evil. I wonder if you've ever heard the saying, you can miss heaven by 18 inches. And that is about the distance between your heart and your head. I was challenged this week, like I've told you, in reading a testimony. A young lady talked of how she had intellectual knowledge of Jesus, but had no heart knowledge of Jesus. She explained that it's like knowing that you have or had a father versus actually knowing your father. She explained that she had experienced God's urgent call to salvation many times in her life, only telling God that she would get to it one day. One day, Lord, I'll think about salvation, but not right now. She was adamant about saying, not right now. Soon enough in life, she found herself December 2011 depressed, sad, unable to think clear, and as she described it, experienced an overpowered demonic oppression. And as her mind was flooded with thoughts that were not even her own, she heard that it was too late, that God had given her too many chances to repent. Too many chances to know him. And that she could knock, but no one would listen. The images of her life flashed through her mind, and she saw all the times that she heard the gospel and refused to give her life to Christ. She felt trapped and helpless. Going on the third day of little to no sleep, she remembers. She remembers the slight whisper from her voice saying, Please, God. I don't know if you've ever been in those dark places, but I can hear her whimper. Please, God, please hear my cry. That moved into a stronger voice of saying, please, God, hear my cry. Into, I beg of you, God, give me another chance. And then she sat there crying. And how she described how the demonic voices of awful proportion left her. She heard a voice that said, come to me, my child. Come and know me. I tell you this story because fearful for my own life as much as anybody else that refuses God. And they are refusing him outside these walls. But December 7th, 2011, she was born again and amen. Believing. Confessing, accepting, being baptized, raising in a new life. She now tells her story to share the deep sense of peace in knowing Jesus Christ. No more shame. No more oppression from sin. And yes, knowing her Jesus intimately from the heart. I can go on and on about a story, but it's important that we leave it with Scripture Ephesians 1 7 in him we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace Galatians 1 4 speaking of our Jesus who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father Isaiah 44, 22, I have swept away your offenses like a cloud your sins like a morning mist Return to me, for I have redeemed you. Acts 3.19. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped away. The times of refreshing may come from. Times of refreshing may come from the Lord God. I invite you this morning, this communion meditation, to come and be one with the Father. And it's only through Jesus and his death, his burial, his resurrection, defeating death, and being raised up in a new and going back to the Father that we can celebrate, that we can remember, and we can come at this point in time and confess. We need to confess We are redeemed, but it's only because of the Father's will and not our own. 
you have the cups and the loaf before you. As we come and sing about a Redeemer, remember, come and confess. Thank you for Jesus, and I thank you for his willingness. Jesus, thank you for being willing to suffer. Not only on the cross, but we read in the scriptures that you suffered a life because you chose to be perfect so you could be the sacrifice and redemption for us to pay that price. Again, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, God, again, for your perfectness. I pray.
pray as we come before you. In Jesus' name, amen. Children's Church is dismissed. <laughs> we lost a shoe, haven't we? <clears throat> Run so fast, you ran right out of them, didn't you, buddy? Okay, there. <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> they always say it's the preacher's kids, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> Somehow we, we can come to that agreement. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Well, hey, we're in James chapter 4 today. We are in James 4. We have... Uh, four more sermons, I think, left. Uh, three or four, I can't remember. Uh, but we got the rest of four and five. So that's how, however many you want me to preach out of that, that's where we got left, all right? So, uh, but, but we're going to be starting James chapter four this morning and uh, just continue our series called Straightforward. And uh, I tell you what, uh, I've, I've heard a couple of you say that you've really enjoyed this series. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it and gotten as much out of it as, as I have. I've been stomped every week. I've wrote a sermon on this thing and uh, on this book, and uh, God has really used it and convicted me of things and shown me things that, that, well, frankly, I probably needed to see. And so I hope that it's done the same thing for you. Uh, with that said, let's go ahead and let's take a minute and uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll get started with our message. And Father, we just come before you and thank you, God. We thank you for being the God who is worthy of our worship. The God who is worthy of our praise, who loves us even though we turn our backs on you again and again. But you are a God of grace. And Lord, as Mike talked about this morning, that you, you keep extending grace. Even when the world whispers, you've gone too far. Even when Satan says, you've gone too far, God. Your grace is enough. And we thank you for that. And we pray, Lord, that we won't only receive grace, but we'll 
give grace as well. That we'll offer grace to those around us that they may experience you through us. For your glory and your praise forever and ever. And we pray, Lord, as we look at your word today, that you would speak through me clearly, speak through your word clearly. Lead us to do whatever we need to do to follow you. That we may be a beacon of light to the world around us. It's your son's name that I pray. Amen. We, we don't really like it, uh, but, but conflict has been part of the world since the fall of man, hasn't it? I mean, we can see examples of this all throughout Scripture. We see it with, with Cain and Abel. We, arguably, we could say probably right there with, with Adam and Eve. You know, Moses doesn't really tell us that they got in an argument, but you know that right there in that moment they were you know, blaming each other and this is on you and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but, but we don't know that for sure, so we'll just pass that by. Cain and Abel got in a fuss. David and Saul, you know, had, had conflict. Peter and Paul had conflict. Jesus even had conflict with the religious leaders. We go on and on and on with plenty of examples. I mean, the, the Bible is chock full of chapters that are just explaining and telling us all about these, these different conflicts, uh, these great conflicts. And so um, we, we read about these, but the truth is we really don't need to read these examples of conflict to really know what they're all about, do we? Because we've all experienced conflict, haven't we? Any of you never had a conflict? Yeah, it'd be nice to live that way, wouldn't it? it all of us have conflict. I mean, we've had them, even since we were growing up, we, we've had them going up through, through school as, as you know, the different factions and things that take place. We, we've experienced them in the workplace, in our community. We've experienced them in our homes, right? I mean, we, whether that's with a spouse or your kids or your parents, whatever it may be. And, and, and odds are, we've experienced, every one of us has experienced some kind of conflict within the church. In fact, conflict is so common within the church that Johnson University, we actually had to take an entire course on it, an entire semester on it uh, that was called Conflict and Community. And we were taught how to handle conflict and all these kinds of different things and uh, just to prepare us for ministry. And the bottom line, though, is, is that all of us face conflicts. Some of those conflicts are small and can, we, we can really pass over them right quickly. Right? I mean, like, it's one of those, if it's not going to matter five years from now, don't let it matter five minutes from now kind of thing. So we just move on and, and, and forget about it. Uh, other conflicts, though, seem like a mountain that's impossible to climb. But either way, either way it is, at some point, if someone sees us and sees that we're having a conflict with someone else, they may come to us and ask a question similar to what James asks in James chapter 4, verse 1. He says, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? We could ask that another way. Maybe it was asked to you in this way, but what started this fight? Why don't you and so-and-so get along? And of course, we always have our reasons, don't we? And they always seem to be given with this, right? The old pointed finger, right? Well, he said, well, she did, well, they just. Or, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of say, you know, if they'll change this, if they'll do this, if they'll take the first step, if they'll whatever, then I'll do this. And even if we acknowledge that we were wrong somewhere along the way, let's be honest, guys, it's, it's often because they did something first, right? Well, they did this to me, so I did that to them. Because I'm not going to be a doormat. I'm just not going to get ran over. I can't do that. So I, they did this to me, so you know, I fought right back, and I, I ain't going to lay down for nobody. That's kind of how we look at it, right? And we justify it by that idea. We have this tendency, though, to, to always point the blame of our anger, the blame of our conflict on anyone and everyone else. But who? Ourselves. And here comes James. James doesn't have, he, he doesn't hold anything back from telling us the truth, does he? James comes in there and says, you knuckleheads. That's what he ought to wrote right here. You knuckleheads, what causes fights? That, that's how I read it anyway. That's what I felt like he was saying to me when I started writing this the other day. Uh, but James comes in in, in, in verse 1, and, and he gives us the real reason, in a straightforward fashion, the real reason for our conflicts among us. 
James chapter 4, verse 1, he says, What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and you do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and you quarrel. And I love the correlation here that James makes because James begins with, uh, with, with really, he, he talks about you know, moving from what's going on among us to what's going on within us. He says, you're looking at the outside circumstances, but it, this conflict isn't something that's going on on the outside. This is going on deep within the surface. You're not fighting because he said or she said or because he did or because she did. James is saying here that the conflicts among us begin within us. Conflicts among us begin within us. In other words, there's this passion within us, this desire within us to have something, and, and we're not getting it. So we're mad about it. If you need an example of this, just, just look at kids for a moment. Paisley and Knox are four and two years old, and there is not a day that passes by where they don't have a conflict over something. Uh, half the time, or some of the time, it's because Knox is a little ornery. I'm sure you haven't gotten that idea from him at all, right? I mean, he's been up here on the stage with me like five times, I think, by this point. And, uh, so Knox can be a little bit ornery. Uh, he likes to torment his sister. I don't know why. But like he'll just pick something up like if he had this bottle, he would pick it up and let me make sure it's closed so I don't spill it all over the stage. But he'll take it and he'll go like this. Ah, like that, and he'll just kind of, I'm still spilling it on the stage. <laughs> Apparently that thing is broken. That's good. Uh, cheap bottles, right? Uh, Knox broke it. Thank you, Tim. Yeah, you're right. My hands are all wet now. Uh, but yeah, Knox, would, he just, he'll go like it, like it's a spear or a javelin or something, right? I mean, like... He, he grew up in the wrong century. He would have been good back there in, like, what is it, 16 or 70 hundreds. They got on those horses and javelin each other. I don't know if they still do that today or not, but he'd be ready for it, man. I mean, he's already got the, everything down pat. But like, he'll do that all the time. Just And half the time he'll hit her with it, half the time he won't. So she never knows if he's going to do it or not. I mean, like, it's just a mind game, I think, with Knox at this point. And so, he, so part of the time they're fighting because, you know, Knox is a little bit honoring. The, the other times, though, they fight, and you probably already know this, right? They fight because Paisley has something that Knox wants, or Knox has something that Paisley wants, and they're not happy about it. So hair gets pulled, skin gets bitten, fists get thrown, hands get caught kind of thing, right? I mean, I mean people, kids, they hit each other and all these kinds of things, and then we go in there, right? We run in there because one of them's screaming, and we're trying to figure out, okay, what's going on, and... What happens? Well, he did this to me. When Knox isn't talking very much yet, but he would point at Paisley and say, mm, mm, you know, it's, it's on her right now, all right? And uh, I don't know if I want to be hearing what he's trying to say sometimes. Uh, but, but he would point the blame at her and say, it, it's all on her. And as parents, we can, we can see what the issue is. They're, they're mad because someone else has something that they want. It's so easy to see that in our kids. It's so difficult to see that in ourselves. Because the truth is, what's true of our kids is, is pretty much what's true of us. Someone else has something and we're not happy about it. Someone else has the the talent or the knowledge or the dream car or home or job. And we're not happy about it. Someone else gets to take all the vacations and post them on social media and we're sitting there looking at them and they got all the popularity and all the likes and all the, the comments and the influence and all these things and, and we're jealous of it and we wish we could have that. So, so we really don't like them all that much because they're living the life that we wish we could have. Or, or maybe someone didn't give us what we thought they were going to give us. Maybe they, they didn't follow through on a promise, or maybe we feel like they owe us something. So we're mad about it. And we could go on and on and on, but the point is there's something that we want. There's something that we want. Whatever it is, whether it's to get back at somebody, or there's an item or something that we desire for ourselves, whether mental or physical, there's something that we want. And we're not getting it, so we're mad. And James says the result every time is that we murder, we fight, we quarrel. 
Now, I don't think any of you are murderers. I'd like to think none of you are murderers. <laughs> I don't know your past. Uh, some of you I wonder about. Uh, maybe. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> uh, truth is, you better move on. Thank you for the encouragement there, Jerry. Jerry said, I've been down this road, man. You don't want to stop. You just want to keep on trucking. Yeah. I don't think any of you guys are murderers. I like to think you all good people. Uh, I don't think that James was talking to any murderers either. Right? I mean, he's talking to the church. Let's hope that James isn't talking to any murderers. Maybe they were in, in their past life or something like that. But, but still, yet, yeah, what James says applies to us, doesn't it? Because in Matthew, 20, uh, Matthew 5, verse 22, Jesus expanded the reach of murder, didn't he? He said, but I say to you, he's saying that, that, you know, you've heard it said that you should not commit murder. He says, but I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. It's this idea that the conflict among us is so deep that, we're, that, that, that all of this issue, we're, we're so deep in conflict, so deep in our anger, so deep in our disappointment that, that we'll fight and we'll quarrel and we will ruin the relationship if we have to. Before we'll give in and come back together. And typically we see this as a me and you issue, Right? Well, this is just between me and them. I get along with everybody else. It's just us. But James shows us it never just stays between me and you, does it? Or you and whoever it may be. James actually shows us that it's, it's a spiritual issue. Look at the second part of verse, of verse 2. James says, you do not have because you do not ask. He says, guys, you... You're wanting whatever it is, and you're not praying for it. That's the first problem. And then he says in verse 3, You ask and you don't receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. And so James, from his, from his viewpoint, their, their spiritual life is kind of messed up right now because they're, they're, they're missing that prayer is supposed to be an important part of their spiritual lives. And James basically says, You're ignoring God until you need something. And then you come to God and you ask Him. But when you do ask Him, you're not even asking Him with the right motives. You're asking Him from your selfish desires and your selfish passions to, so that you can have, you know, this is all about me. And we look at that and we say, man, aren't we glad we're not like that today? Again, these people, James, that church needs some problems. They need some help. They had some problems, right? But... Let's be honest for a moment. How often does that happen for us? How often, do, often do, do we let prayer become a last resort instead of a natural part of our spiritual lives? When life is going good and you know, everything is fine and dandy, we, we might only pray when we think about it, when the cro thought crosses our minds, or we might pray whenever we're in church, but, but beyond that, we may forget to pray as often as we should and when life, man, when life takes that unexpected turn and we are in need, what's the first thing we do? Oh, God. Oh, Father. Oh, Lord Jesus. We make this list of things that, that we want God to do for us. Right? And James has some pretty strong language for that. Verse 4, he says, you adulterous people. I'm going to stop there for a moment because I don't know if you've noticed this, but as we've walked through the book of James, James has always said something like, my dear brothers and sisters, you know, fellow workers in Christ type mentality, this term of endearment, this I love you kind of thing. And here James says, you adulterous people. He says, you're cheating on God. If this is what you're doing, you're cheating on God. You're just using God to get whatever you want. He says, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? 
Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And so James' point here is the conflict among us begin within us because we want something that we can't have. But deeper than that, he says, guys, we become friends with the world. And when we think about friends, i got people I ain't talked to in five years, and sometimes I'll call them friends, right? You'll say, well, that's my friend. When's the last time I talked to him? You know, it's been about a decade ago. I saw him at the last high school reunion kind of thing, right? I mean, we, we got these people. Friendship with us is, is not very close-knit kind of things. Friendship in this time period was intimacy. You, you didn't call someone your friend. I mean, it's kind of probably like what we would call our best friend. That's how they looked at friendship. And so when, when, when James says you're a friend of the world, in other words, James is saying that like you're best friends with the world, that, 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 that you're, you, there, there's something that we've wanted, there's something we desire, there's something we've longed for, or, or maybe someone we've longed for more than we've wanted and desired and longed. God. And we replace the only one who can give us fulfillment with an earthly, temporary fulfillment. We found a mistress in the things and the people of the world. Because of that, James says, we, if, if that's us, we become enemies of God, which sounds like a pretty bad thing, doesn't it? We're all going to have enemies, but I don't think I want God to be one of my enemies. It's not a good thing. But the good thing is, thank God it's not without hope. Look at verse 5. James says, Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the Scripture says he yearns jealously over the Spirit that he has made to dwell in us? Man, I love that verse. Yearns jealousy, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. In other words, James says, even though we've looked in other places for fulfillment, even though we've longed for something or someone more than we've longed for God, James says that God comes in and he still longs for us and he still yearns for us and he still wants this relationship with us. And while he has every right in the world to divorce us and walk away from us, James says he offers us more grace. He extends that second and that third and that thousandth and that ten thousandth chance. Which is amazing news, isn't it? Quite frankly, maybe it's some shocking news because if we were in God's shoes, we're not doing that, are we? Let's be honest for a moment. Someone does something like that to us. Someone does a lot less than that to us. We're riding them off. We're kicking them to the curb. We're cutting ties. We're done with them. But God doesn't do that. Even while we put our agenda, our desires before God, God says, I still want a relationship with you. But James says we have to let go of our pride and humble ourselves before God to get it. I'm sure you already know this, but pride gets in the way of a lot, doesn't it? And make no mistake, the prideful desire for more or for better or, or for you know, getting back at someone or getting even or whatever it may be, it always stands between us and other people. But as one pastor put it, more importantly, if we have conflict with someone else, he says our greatest issue is not that we have conflict with others. That's just a smoke screen. He says it's much bigger. It's much deeper. Our conflict is with God. That's really the essence of what James is saying here. He's saying we have a horizontal conflict. We have a conflict with those who are out beside of us because we have a vertical conflict. The conflict among us begins within us, but it begins as a spiritual issue more than anything else. If we need an example of that, just look to Jesus. Jesus had conflict with religious leaders all the time, but he still loved them. Still one of the best for them. And why is that? Because he had this correct. He had the relationship with his father 
correct so he could love out among the people who, who were out there, the people who were threatening to stone him, the people who were, 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 were trying to trap him every single day, the people who put him on the cross because he had this relationship correct. He's able to say, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. I don't know about you, but, but I want to have that kind of grace and I want to have that kind of forgiveness. I want to have that kind of heart. So the question becomes, how, how do we do that? How, how do we fix all this? How, how do we re- restore a relationship with, with God and, 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 and humble ourselves and restore a relationship with other people? And, and, and I feel at this point I need to give you a disclaimer just, just to say one thing. I, I'm not sure that God wants us to fully restore every single relationship we've ever had. If someone has been abusive to you in some way, listen, it is, it is healthy and it is necessary for you to get away from that relationship. God's not saying go back to it. But if there's something inside of you that's still eaten up with it, if there's something inside of you, you think of that person and anger comes through you. If you, if you think of that person, you know, you, you get all these different feelings and all these different frustrations. If forgiveness hasn't been offered, if, if you still feel mad as if they owe you something, we're not quite even yet. And it reveals this spiritual problem inside of you. And please understand, I'm not trying to discredit anything that someone has done to you. Listen, if you told me what someone has done to you, I'd probably say throw them in jail, shut the door, slam the door shut, lock it, toss the key. Right? I'm right there with you. I'm right there with you. I'd be mad too. My heart goes out for you. But if it's still inside you, It's just going to eat away at you. It is going to eat away at you every single day. So how do we address it? How do we address this issue within us? James begins talking about that in verse 7. He says, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves therefore, or humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Did you get all that? Y'all ready to go now, aren't you? That's a lot. I mean, James just like pops them off one after another and you're... I, I'm sure if they, were, if, you know, if they had paperback feeling, they're like, dude, could you slow down just a little bit? i got to write this down, right? I, I, mean, I mean, I don't have enough time. I don't write that fast. Because uh, he just throws them all out there. In fact, I, I've highlighted behind me ten different commands that he gives us just within these four verses. But really, it all boils down to one thing. Fix the vertical relationship first. Before you do anything, Start with your relationship with God. I love how James moves throughout this passage because James begins this passage with talking about the issues, the personal issues among us, but his first step in fixing our personal issues is by addressing what's in us, isn't it? He doesn't start off with, okay, well, what did they do and how did that make you feel? He starts off with, where are you at with God? How's this relationship? And so he says, we've we got to fix that part. We, we have to fix that part of a relation, uh, relationship. We have to, to fix the vertical part first. And so how do we fix the vertical part? How, how do we address this? Two words for you. Resist and repent. Resist and repent. Two words. They're kind of small, ain't they? I aren't they bad. They look really small on that one, though, I'll tell you. That resist and repent. He says, resist the temptations of the devil. 
Resist those desires that are waging war within you. Resist that pull and that desire for the things of this world, the passions of this world. And he says, if you stumble, if you fall, when you stumble, when you fall, he says, repent, which basically just means turn away from that lifestyle, turn away from that sin, turn toward God and submit to God and draw near to God through prayer and reading His Word and worshiping a God who is so worthy of our worship. Yearn for God as He yearns for you and make God the top priority, the top desire of your heart. Start off by humbling ourselves, following before the Creator of this world. Resist and repent. And then James says in verse 11, Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There's only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? In other words, James says, stop fighting. Stop, stop all this bickering. Stop the judging each other. Stop being mad for reasons that one day on down the road, we're going to look back and say, that was the dumbest argument I've ever had in my life. You've been there, ain't you? get mad over something, it it lasts for days, and a year later you're laughing about it because it was so silly. And listen, when we reach eternity's shores, it's all going to be silly. I'm not saying, again, I'm not discrediting what has happened. But when we really come to grasp with the love that God has had for us, the forgiveness that God has had for us, We experience the grace of God. We realize we can can extend grace and love and mercy and forgiveness to anyone. So James says, guys, drop all the nonsense. Drop the covering. Just love horizontally. Just love the people around you. And how do we love the people around us? We do that through the one another's of Scripture. There's a bunch of them. I'll give you a few. Try serving that person. Serve one another. Encourage one another. Be happy and joyful for one another. Live in harmony with one another. Be patient with one another. Carry one another's burdens. Be compassionate to one another and kind to one another. Forgive one another. And I could go on and on and on and on and on. However it looks, love one another. And I could give all kinds of applications, really, but, but all of this boils down to two things, doesn't it? Two most important commands. What were they? Jerry gave the extended version. I'm going to give you the shortened version. Love God. Love people. Love God and love people. When Jesus gave this command, he wasn't saying, if you get the first one right, but if you fudge on the second one, you're still okay. Jesus was saying, because we let's be honest, we fudge on that second one quite a bit. Jesus was saying, They're hand in hand. You cannot do one without the other. So if we have issues out this way, if we have horizontal conflict, let me tell you, it's going to affect our vertical relationship with God. If you need a reminder, that look look at the cross. If if, if the cross goes out, the cross goes up and down. If this relationship isn't right, then it's going to affect this relationship with God every single time. It's going to affect... Every relationships. So if you have conflict this morning, guys, James is pleading with you. I am pleading with you, but more importantly, God is pleading with you. Don't sweep it under the rug. Don't try to act like there's nothing there. Don't try to hide it. Eventually that rug, it's not going to conceal it anymore. And again, it's going to affect all of our relationships with God, with other people. So instead of hiding, instead of fighting, instead of holding on to it, do what James encourages us to do. Fix the vertical relationship. Find your fulfillment in God and in God alone and the love that our God has for us. Love across your horizontal relationships as you let go of that pride and the passion and the desires that wage war within you because after all, God opposes the proud. He opposes the ones who hold on to that conflict. But listen, He gives grace and abundant grace, and He offers more grace to the humble.
Let go of that pride. Choose humility. And above all else, seek God. And if you will, I'd be willing to bet. I'm not a betting man, but if I was, I'd be willing to bet that you'll improve every relationship you have, including the most important relationship you have, your relationship and your walk with our God. And so, Father, we come before you, Lord, and it's hard not to read this passage and, Lord, really preach this passage and think about the, all, the grace and the forgiveness and the love that you have shared with us. God, you should have kicked us to the curb a long time ago. You should have gotten rid of us a long time ago. But God, in your love, you decided to, to pursue us still. To chase us. To reach out for us and yearn for us. God, you have such a deep desire for us. Lord, put that desire in our hearts for you as well. To walk in your will, to do whatever it is that you would have us to do. And be faithful and obedient to you. And that is even within our relationships here on earth. That we'll let go of whatever it is that is holding us back from loving some person. And we would just love them like you loved us. That's the only way we know love because you loved us first. God, help us to show that love to those around us as well. God, most importantly, we, we ask this so that we can have a right relationship with you. That we can walk hand in hand with you every single step of the way. As we look forward to the day when we get to be there with you. Praising you and worshiping you for all eternity. Thank you, God, for that. Thank you for your gifts. And you're something I pray. Amen. Just be standing.
those passions and those issues that wage war within us, that we surrender ourselves, that we may have the right relationship with our Father. Uh, I want to ask that you all uh, be seated. And if you don't care, step down from the, from the stage. I'm going to ask Tracy to join me. I'm going to have to read this to you because I won't be able to get through it if I just say it out loud. So, um, to the elders and congregation of Community Christian Church, nearly eight years ago we began a journey together with no one sure of where or how this journey would go. I was 23 years old, fresh out of school. I was inexperienced as you could be. You were stepping into a new era of ministry after having just spent 11 years with one minister that I know you all love dearly. By your grace, you extended an offer to us, and we accepted. I can't thank you enough for your willingness to be patient with me, and I know you had to be several times. I can't thank you enough for the grace you offered time and time again. I can't thank you enough for the memories we've shared. You, You were with us on our wedding day. You were with us through all the births of our children. You were with us through highs and lows. We have grown tremendously together. You played a big part in that. And that's what makes this day, this moment so hard. Uh, As of today, I'm formally resigning from the Office of Minister at Community Christian Church. So we have accepted the position of campus pastor at Woodland Hills Christian Church in Meadowview, Virginia. The elders have invited us to serve here with you until we move, and and we plan to be here with you up until the end with a tentative date of around the 1st of August. Please know that this was not an easy decision for us. Tracy, the kids, and I have come to love you all deeply. You are part of our ministry, a big part of our ministry story, and we will be forever, forever grateful for you. But after much Believe me, there's much, much prayer that went into this. We feel as if God's will is leading our family to this church, to that church at this time. I ask that you pray for us. One of the many reasons we enjoyed here, just beyond you guys being our family, was being close to our Tracy's family here as well. And there's going to be a transition period for us all because this is going to be a move that puts us four hours away. So I ask that you pray for us during this transition period. Pray especially for for Tracy and for Paisley. as it's going to be much more difficult for them, I'm sure. And I ask that you pray fervently for us, for peace and for strength to continue the work of the kingdom in this new location. And please know that we also pray for you. I've already begun praying for you. Praying for what's... Coming ahead for the future of this church. A church we have come to know and love so deeply. And I, I'm already praying for the next minister, and I pray that you will welcome him and love him and his family just the same as you have welcomed and loved us. You'll always hold a special place in our hearts. We're not who we are today without you. I never thank you enough. With love, Jonathan, Tracy, Paisley, Knox, and Ash. Uh, so, so Jonathan broke uh, this news to us Wednesday, and um, we're, we're excited for him. Uh, it came to a surprise. Uh, I was hoping Jonathan would would, would retire here, be, begin in, in his ministry here. But uh, unfortunately, all good things come to an end. And um, I'm excited for Jonathan and his family in, in this uh, new journey that, that God has for them. And I know that they will be blessed and, and God will bless them and, and whatever they do. And um, as Jonathan uh, requested, just uh, just ask for prayers over him and his family as they transition and, and the church that they're going to that 
uh, they'll welcome him um, the same way that we love him. And uh, there will definitely be, be big holes uh, here to fill. And um, Tim and me will be, be working on that. And uh, we'll, we'll keep you up to date as, as we go throughout the different steps and uh, the different progress progress as it goes and, and those things. But uh, please be in prayer for the church and uh, the minister the, to, to come and the, the minister search and everything that goes along with that. But, uh, but most importantly, just... Uh, uh, God's got God's got great things for for both Jonathan and us, and um, and uh, good things are to come for both of us. So um, I'd say if you feel comfortable, um, you know, gather around. If if not, I know COVID uh, still still lingering with COVID things. So um, I just asked him to to close us out in prayer. Lord, we bow with me, everybody. Uh, Lord, Lord, uh, you know we. Many of us here have, have held positions and jobs, and anyway, if, if we've had more than one. And when you're in a calling, it's just so much different. And we know that, uh, and, and it's different for the people who are left behind. Um, but we know that through your grace and through your guidance that you will show us a new way, and you'll the kingdom will grow, and, that, and that's, that is the key. The kingdom will grow, and we'll do it in different ways and in different places. Jonathan's been my only minister here. I came when he was very young, and Nancy and I just thought he was a great, and he's done nothing but get better all the time. And we just uh, we know we're going to miss him. Uh, my first eldership ever, <laughs> and John is my my first buddy, my first minister. So, we you know we know that it hurts, and we know that however that's going to be successful, we're going to keep sowing and growing and going, and John's going to keep doing that in Virginia, and he's going to bless another group of people, and they're going to bless him and. That's what's the the wonder of of the of, of being part of the Christian family. We don't lose people; we just gain more. And we just thank you for all the good times and all the good things and all the growth in our spirits that have happened with this young man and lady here. And we just ask that you bless them and bless all of those over there in Virginia, and and they continue to just have a, a, a miraculous growth in their church. <clears throat> And that we can go out and find one at a time here and just show them through our actions how this man has improved our spirit through God's help and through Jesus' help and through the Holy Spirit who lives in all of us. So as we transition out, we just, we just love you. We know you've got the best in mind for all of us. And everybody has an opportunity to do more for you through changes that come on our lives. Again, we love you. We thank you for your son. And it's his dear name we pray right now. Amen.